Okay, so thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, before we begin, I uh, just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all joining uh, today and zooming in, um, lands in which we all live, work, and learn. I'm joining today from the land of the Gadigal people, from the Eora Nation. Uh, you're, please feel, feel free to share the places where you're joining uh, in the chat today um, and share that uh, with everyone. Uh, and I would also like to uh, thank you all for coming today um, and joining in this special um, seminar, which is a little bit different than the seminars that we've had uh, up till now. Um, so what we've had many times is just focus on one speaker in these uh, lunchtime seminars uh, and then having discussions around different uh, um, topics that are sort of highlighted from that um, talk. But today we decided to try and mix it up a little bit and bring you three speakers uh, to all talk about one common uh, topic, which is citizen science and education. Uh, and so I'm glad to see um, all the people that um, joined today uh, and came to, to listen to this really interesting panel. Um, and if you have any questions or any things that you wanna ask, um, feel free to write it in the chat, but we will also open this up for a conversation uh, at a later stage um, during the conversation. I'm uh, Yaela Golumbic. Uh, I will be um, uh, moderating today. Uh, I also have a background um, that is related to citizen science and education. This is a topic I'm very passionate about personally. And so I'm very happy to hear from all our speakers today. And I will just um, introduce them one by one uh, so you know who you're talking to and um, I feel this is a really special panel that we have today because um, each one of these fantastic women that are joining us today comes from a completely different background uh, and brings, you know, very unique experiences today to discuss. So I'm very excited to hear um, everything you have to say today. So firstly, we have Dr. Erin Fagan Jeffries. She's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Adelaide and South Australian Museum, and she's studying let me see if I can say this correctly. Parasitoic, uh, parasitoic wasps, yes. Uh, <laughs> she is part of a team that is um, running the Insect Investigation Citizen Science Project for regional schools to document insects and biodiversity in their local area. Uh, the project was also a recipient of the new uh, Inspiring Australia uh, grants that we've just been uh, announced uh, last month. So uh, congratulations, Erin. Next, we have Genevieve Denev Fermer. She is doing a PhD in chemistry education at the University of Sydney at the SCOPE Group, the Science Communication, Education, Outreach, Participation, and Education. Uh, previously, she was a senior science teacher and curriculum coordinator in the Northern Territories. Uh, and her fo research focuses on how curriculum influences classroom experiences for year 11 and uh, year 12 um, in chemistry and how teachers can be supported to use peer review education practices in their classrooms. Thank you for joining, Jen. Uh, lastly, but not least, um, Arjumand Khan, she is an entrepreneur, environmental scientist, science communicator, and a passionate community capacity builder. She's the founder of STEM Catalyst, which is a grassroots community organization established by migrant STEM professional women. Um, Arch shares knowledge and passion for nature and for science through a wide array of STEM education activities. And she's also very active in the community and volunteers her time for several uh, causes, social, environmental, and citizen science, of course. And so before I begin, um, we start talking about citizen science. Maybe we can just hear from each of you a little bit about yourself, a little bit more from what I've sort of discussed. Uh, what are your experiences? What brought you uh, to where you are today? You can just, uh, Jen, why don't you start just randomly? Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. So for me, my interest in citizen science sort of came from this 
real desire to get involved in real science in classrooms. So um, I thought this seemed like a really good idea, but a lot of people sort of were like, oh, I don't know if this is really possible. But I came across this project called the Black Autumn Bees Project, um, where a neuroscientist had worked with students in England to um, do some real research on bees, bees, and they'd actually managed to publish it in the Biology Letters Journal. And that just sort of like sparked me. I was like, this is actually possible. This is something I can do. Um, and, and so that was the beginning of my journey in citizen science. And then um, working in a school in the Northern Territory, we had some really interesting um, land around the school. We had some cast limestone area that had sinkholes. Um, and they also it also had some endangered grasses, sorghum grasses, and possibly unidentified land geckos and land snails. And so I was really excited about this idea of potentially discovering and describing new species with my students. And so my journey sort of came from this desire to do real science with my students. And then we sort of ended up starting up this kind of grassroots citizen science project before I knew what citizen science really was. Um, and now I'm working in a group with people like Yela who know and understand they're really involved in citizen science and I'm getting involved in that in a um, in the capacity of working through the Breaking Good and Essential Medicines uh, projects where we're looking at bringing drug design and, and discovery um, into a citizen science sphere there. So now I'm working on it in a more official capacity, I suppose. Thank you, Jen. Aris, you want to go next? Go. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ella. And um, yeah, my journey to citizen science, citizen science started back in 2017, um, where uh, I was representing um, a global panel of citizens, uh, global panel of migrant scientists and engineers um, from STEM backgrounds um, through a program in Royal Society of Victoria. Um, and after that, even slowly I've um, started concentrating that project in my local area. So um, one hour long project was actually um, enlarged and magnified to be delivered to a primary school children, upper, upper primary school children, um, where we gave them the opportunity um, in lunchtime and um, recess time um, that they could experience hands-on learning. So that was like uh, a light bulb, light bulb moment for many um, upper primary students. And they have they really felt that science, which is happening around us can be felt through doing simple activities. So, um, and that really made the, the school management. So this is through CSIRO um, that we launched the program called STEM Professionals in Schools. And slowly we built up and when the significant uh, interest was developed we were told that you know why don't we um, why don't we women who are volunteering for a school for one whole academic year go out there and you know set up set up an official when uh, ourselves as a vendor so that the school can you know officially bring this expertise alongside teachers so a bit of a background that I don't have a teaching background um, but science and and nature is my passion. So how can we incorporate that passion together, which amalgamates beautifully through citizen science, um, and that we can create that spark in young, uh, you know, an inspiration in young minds. So that's how STEM Catalyst came into being. Uh, over to you, Erin. I guess, uh, like Aj, I came from the science side of things. So uh, I was pure research when I did did honours and I was studying little crustaceans. Um, I then went and studied science communication at ANU and that kind of broadened me out of my academic silo and took me into regional places of Australia and I connected with people and got really excited about the idea of, um, you know, science being more than just researchers in institutions and science being done by lots of people. Uh, so when I started my PhD, I wanted to find a way to do that and discovered citizen science and that, you know, this idea was already a really established um, practice. And so that was kind of my first entry into it was finding a way that I could incorporate citizen science into my PhD to allow me to, you know, broaden my project out from just me doing it in isolation. But also, I guess, selfishly, citizen science was a way that combined the two things that I loved, which was doing research and it was doing science communication and working with people and citizen science was kind of that perfect combo of, of those two things.
Thank you so much. And I'm really glad that we, you know, got to to meet you a little bit and to and to hear about your journeys. And I find that when we look at citizen science and people that are doing citizen science, people come into it from so many different angles. Um, and I think just find it really, really interesting to see, you know, what that background is and what people's journey uh, into citizen science was. Uh, and so now that we've learned a little bit about that, maybe we can um, hear a little bit about the programs that you're running and what citizen science projects you're involved with uh, and how you're uh, engaging young people in science through citizen science. Erin, why don't you go first? Yeah, so uh, the Insect Investigators project that we're getting off the ground at the moment um, is probably very, very close to my heart and something I'm very passionate about. And it's about getting regional school students to actually be part of discovering their biodiversity uh, and documenting it, uh, and then hopefully getting to name new species. So um, we're partnering schools with taxonomists, which are the scientists who name and describe um, new species. And in this case, we're focusing on insects. So uh, the schools that we'll be working with will um, be running uh, something called a malaise trap, which is a um, kind of looks a bit like a tent. It's sort of a freestanding trap that passively collects insects. Um, and we'll then be doing some DNA barcoding of the insects in their samples and sending the, um, the insects off to, to scientists to tell us a little bit more about them and then feeding all those results back to the schools. And it's, it's all about really trying to connect people with uh, their local environment. And, you know, we, we think we've only named 30% of the insects in Australia. So there's so much to be discovered and, and it, it really can't be done by the kind of employed researchers that we, that we currently have. It's got to be a bigger effort. And we're kind of hoping this project is a way to, to start that. Um, so we're kind of we're just about to sort of do an official launch and and try and get some schools and taxonomists involved. Uh, we did a little trial uh, over the last couple of years with four schools in regional South Australia, um, and that was super successful. So, yeah, hoping it all goes well. That's really exciting. We'll all um, cross our fingers for you and uh, for the success of the program. Arj. Um, RJ, I know you also had some pictures you wanted to share and some videos, so feel free to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we actually, you know, when we started um, doing citizen science, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And when the schools were closed and we were working closely with schools, um, that's where we, we decided, you know, um, to come with this innovative, um, you know, way of keeping children busy and students busy in their continual process of learning. Um, so we, we held um, webinars during the National Science Week and prior to that we were holding, um, the pandemic stress was getting intense, you know, by mid-June, July last year and being mothers ourselves, just a minute, please. Um, that's the prayer call, just a minute. So There I am back. So um, as I was saying that in the middle of the pandemic, um, when it was getting intense, you know, children staying at home uh, and there was this five minutes and 10 minutes of walk that that was planned, um, what, what, can, what best can we do? Um, and that's where we decided that let's turn to these app-based citizen science projects, wherein we can keep their continual with their process of learning as a journey and encourage them more. So um, we started delivering free webinars to community children um, within our own contacts, first of all, and then to the outside community councils when they come, came to know about this, they really loved the programs and they funded the programs. So um, we ran a fair few projects. If you would like to play the first video, there's only one video there. That was um, the project um, funded by Inspiring Australia. Uh, and that's where we taught um, children to code a small bank card size gadget called Microbit. Um, and that was their learning to how to code as well as going in their, you know, 
backyard of the community house to find how much uh, diverse life we can find. So there were two groups, um, a fauna group and a flora um, group. So basically the children who were placed in the flora group went and found as many different species of plants that they can find um, through their um, uh, coded microbit, which acted as a counter. And they brought in some really amazing insects and cre um, creepy crawlies uh, in, onto the table to view them close. So we've handed them LED magnifying glasses. We discussed their structures and then we, we noted the biodiversity within that, within that um, small space. And it was really amazing um, if you could play that video, you know. There we go. So that, that's something that, you know, um, that was in between the windows of those lockdowns, we planned that event and um, that event was um, really liked by the community and we kept volunteering after that, we kept volunteering for more um, because the interest is so uh, immense that children love to, you know, go outdoors. We conducted a few more citizen science activities along the creek um, and yeah, they were they were different to um, to biodiversity. We were looking at the water bugs, and then we had a couple done on wild pollinators. So that's how um, you know outside of the schools, we were still using citizen science, same age group, same children. But um, again, I would say it's a very informal way of sparking the love for STEM. Thank you. Uh, that, that really looks amazing. That video is um, so inspiring and makes us all want to go back and you know, search for insects and uh, things like that. Okay, thanks so much. Jen, do you want to tell us a little bit about your projects? Yeah, so um, the sinkhole project I was talking about that we worked on in, in school in, in Catherine in the Northern Territory was kind of similar to both of those projects in terms of like trying to really get students and learners to to get engaged with noticing insects around noticing biodiversity. And we also sort of tried to go into the sort of um, fire management um, space as well. So we try and monitor the way the land changed. We have a wet season and a dry season, often fires in the dry season every year up there. And so we'd also try and get that sort of um, ecological management involved in that project. Um, so that's kind of similar to what uh, Aaron and Arj are doing, but the um, projects I'm working on now in at the University of Sydney are very different to that. They're, they're chemistry-based projects. So Breaking Good project is one that's mostly lab-based. So we're working 
with the public, but mostly undergraduate students and sometimes year 11 and 12 science extension or chemistry students to involve them in the drug discovery and design process. Um, we worked with the open source malaria project and the open source mycetoma project to develop some new medicines and also worked on uh, different ways of synthesizing medicines that we already have with the Breaking Good project and, and involving students in maybe if they can't get into the lab, um, thinking of ways that they could um, look at the reaction mechanisms and design those medicines. So that's the Breaking Good project and the Essential Medicines project is kind of a almost you might describe it as a spin-off of that project where um, we're looking at the accessibility of those medicines. So I, I sort of like explaining it to students as there's no point in all these scientists making these amazing medicines if no one is able to or feels like they can or feel safe accessing these medicines. So the Essential Medicines Project is an online project where we're getting people to do research um, online or in their lives and try and help us to understand the accessibility of existing medicines around the world. Um, we focus on the WHO's World Health Organization's essential medicines list, so the medicines that really everyone in the world should have access to, and we try and understand some different aspects that, of that, whether the prices have changed in different places or the way people are interacting with those medicines on media. They might have seen or heard things about it. And we're trying to gather information about that. And then also we have a challenge where we look at sort of the broader life cycle of medicines and get and get students or the public to be involved in um, understanding like business changes and, and changes in um, registration of what medicines are used for over time, just anything we can find on those medicines. And my particular involvement in that project is trying to sort of insert it into this school space. So we've got the project very um, well established with Yaler's leadership um, in the sort of public sphere. And I'm sort of trying to help find ways to bring that into a year year nine and 10 school space. And we're starting off with running some workshops and we're starting to chip away at um, moving towards a teacher-led model where we can embed it into a chemistry and biology unit and teachers can actually run the normal curriculum and with, like with the citizen science lens, the essential medicines lens as well. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Thank you, Jen. And Jen and I have been working together for the past year or so uh, on some of these projects and Jen's work has been really amazing in bringing her perspective and her professional background as a teacher into the project and thinking of ways um, to incorporate this in schools, um, sort of looking through those lens. And I think that's something that is really, really important because as I said, we all come to citizen science from a different place and from a different background. So maybe we can talk a little bit now about how you think that background and particularly your background, Jen, as a teacher has influenced your involvement uh, in citizen science and each of you can obviously speak um, from, from her experience. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll jump in. I think there's lots of things we experienced from the research perspective in terms of um, sort of the challenges and opportunities of bringing citizen science into schools. I think a lot of people here today would really agree that they've seen incredible outcomes of students really getting engaged, seeing that spark in their eye, not just in relation to science, but I think for me also seeing students just really sort of take leadership and take ownership, take control. Um, the students I worked with in the Northern Territory that are involved in my project um, were arranged to kids that were the top of the class to students that really had trouble engaging in the formal schooling system. And I saw a big change in all of them and that was wonderful. But I think what I wanted to sort of nut this down to today was sort of three things that maybe I can see here that might be challenges from a teacher perspective and just things that we need to, to be aware of when we're asking educators to get involved in citizen science. And, and one of those things I touched on before is that sometimes for people who haven't been super involved in science before, they might think you're a little bit sort of out of touch if, you, if you're saying, yeah, I want to do real genuine science in schools. Um, and people are like, you can't do that. What are you talking about? And I think that can be a real challenge. And I think maybe if as a, as a group here, one of the things we can do is work on really promoting some really good examples of citizen science and students doing amazing science in, in schools. That would actually be really powerful because there probably are teachers out there who want to do this but aren't really able to because it doesn't seem possible to a lot of the people around them. I think the second thing is that citizen science is a very project-based, it's very student-driven work and there's really uncertain outcomes. And one of the things we need to keep in mind is many teachers to do that in a classroom are going to really have to completely overhaul 
the way they teach. Many teachers, many of us teachers have been taught, you know, that the way to teach is to come in and communicate the science, that science is sort of an authoritative, truthful thing. Um, and you don't necessarily feel comfortable with the idea of like critiquing or questioning that. And if personally you don't feel comfortable with that, it's hard to lead that in a classroom. And I think I think I'm sort of coming to the realization that unless you're sort of critiquing other people's processes and conclusions and their thoughts, you can't really engage in the scientific process. So, so this idea of science as an authoritative thing is really sort of getting in the way of us being able to bring citizen science into schools. And I know there are plenty of teachers out there who look at look at science differently and understand that critique thing. Um, but if we're engaging lots of people in it, like teachers in many ways are going to have to really completely overhaul the way they they act in a classroom and you sort of have to give up some of that power and authoritarian like feeling like you know the answer to everything because it is citizen science we don't know the answer yet and students are going to be asking questions we don't know yet so you really have to completely overhaul this thing and that's really deeply personal really embedded in who you are and your professional and personal identity so it's really really challenging and it's important when we're going into schools that we sort of understand that. Um, I think the third thing is that um, citizen science, uh, that this uncertain outcomes thing. When you're a teacher and you're trying to plan assessments, you need to make sure it fits in with the requirements of the curriculum. You need to make sure it's accessible in a certain way. You need to make sure that's fair. So imagine trying to write a rubric and you're going to say, all right, the students all need to create a graph and they need to do a line of best fit and they need to do a, a regression analysis or something like that. And then it turns out some of your students are asking questions and getting qualitative data and they want to actually do a bar graph and all of a sudden your assessment doesn't work. But because of the school system, sometimes you have to send out those assessments, get them approved, send them out to families 12 months in advance so you're stuck. So it, it can be really hard within a school system and a lot of them are quite rigid to figure out how you're going to fit it into a unit, figure out how you're going to assess it. And unfortunately, um, schools are very time poor in some way. So if it's, it's hard to run, it, run something in a classroom that doesn't fit into that curriculum and assessment structure. So it's really important, I think, as citizen scientists here that we do some of that legwork to help bring those things together. And I think the learning by doing and, and some of the stuff I just doing with the learning by doing project and, and mapping out citizen science projects to the curriculum is a really important first step. And so I think those three points, the sort of that a lot of people don't think this real science is possible with students, that it's really project-based student-driven work. So you have to do a complete overhaul of pedagogy and the way we think about teaching and sort of fitting it into the school system sort of illustrates really nicely that um, the school is a really complicated world and we're trying to bring the school world together with the academic world. Um, and I think it's really important that we all keep an open mind and understand that we don't understand each other's worlds and we try and help each other understand each other's worlds. I'll say that because I was a teacher first, and now I've come into research and I was trying to engage a bit with scientists sometimes and I could get really frustrated. I'm like, why can't you be flexible? Why can't you just help me do the things I want to do for my students that I really care about? What are you doing? But now I understand that academia is also a place that there's really rigid timelines. There's really like important things that you have to fit into the system and so you're both working from really kind of in some ways rigid systems and you need to find a way to bring that together and that's tough so I think there are things we can do to help understand each other's worlds in order to work together really collaboratively um, yeah the very different worlds and we need to work on understanding them yeah Jen, that's a fascinating perspective. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think we all have a lot of things to think about. Um, and I think we often don't um, step out of our comfort zone to look at other people's perspectives and other people's way of, you know, thinking about things and their requirements and their, you know, systems. So I think it's a really important message. Um, RJ, Aaron, which one of you wants to go next? Yeah, Erin. Um Please go. Yeah, I think a bunch of the stuff that Jen has raised are things that we're trying to, to work through and process. And the team that's involved, I think, is so critical in that, you know, as I said, I'm from a science background. I don't have a teaching background. And so for me, it's been really important to have people who do have that teaching background or who have worked more closely with teachers to help us, you know, do things so that we do have a, you know, a curriculum linked list, which was 
the first thing when I started talking to teachers, that's what they wanted. And, you know, it was like way down my priority list, whereas for them it was, you know, right up the top. So, yeah, that way of, of, of compromising and finding ways that the project works for both researchers and for the teachers and educators is so important. And I'm finding that can be quite challenging because we've got um, taxonomists and scientists who are part of the project who have done very limited work um, with the public before and some of those perhaps have a bit of a, a challenge of, of the compromises we're having to make to the scientific side of the research so that there are better outcomes for the teachers and the schools because obviously if, if you were given this amount and a grant money just to do the science part of it, you would do it in a very different way from the way we're doing it as a citizen science project. Uh, so trying to find that happy medium between where we get good outcomes for teachers and they get what they want out of it and that students have some learning and, you know, some benefits out of it, but also that the research is sound and we get real research outcomes as well um, is probably the biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment which I think echoes a lot of, of the things that Jen brought up. Yeah, Erin, um, yeah, totally agree with, you know, um, both of your opinions, um, Jen, Jen's and yours. But, you know, for me, I think um, one step forward is that um, looking around us and learning from the global countries is that countries who've already done this many, many years ago, and they've seen the output of, of such a connection. Um, I think the US, um, from my um, research, what I've learned is that US has actually started a side um, complementary, you know, um, complementary body of national informal STEM network. So this is, again, citizen science and an amalgamation of citizen science into schools, into communities and into, you know, so it's, it, it takes over all age groups, not just students, you know, and um, adults as well. So starting from pre-primary, primary level up to tertiary level and, you know, ahead of that into research, we've seen um, countries taking lead and, getting the outcomes of, of this process. So um, we are lagging a little bit behind in that sense that, you know, we would we would want to bring in that thing which has already been done. We're not really like um, making something um, new that that's absolutely not comprehensive or um, that's not comprehensible by, you know, um, other faculties. But um, that's where I think uh, if someone's an expert um, in research or, you know, um, doing a research on a particular um, species and things like that, we, we see that, you know, they are the experts, they're the subject matter expert in their own field. And having that cross-curricular connections um, really enhances the outcome. So, again, as Erin said, you know, I'm not, I don't have a teaching background, I don't know those teaching ter terminologies which schools use and that really stopped as a barrier you know that that we couldn't continue showing how important a particular citizen science project would be for a grade four grade five but then um it, it's more of a thought that um teachers majority of the australian primary school teachers not having a stem background that's impacting the way how children perceive science or STEM in their, in their learning. So when they are in high school, when the disengagement is here, there's a huge um, hue and cry that there's a disengagement. Let's have programs, you know, to, to bring back their attention and bring back their um, concentration to these subjects. Whereas um, I believe it's a little bit too late down the track, but if they are, you know, um, in grades, in mid, middle middle primary years and upper primary years, that's that's where the engagement happens, and that's where it could be playfully embedded in their curriculum. So, as Jen mentioned, you know, we, we are um, working. STEM Catalyst is taking, you know, going to undertake that work with um, a research project called Learning by Doing uh, with the University of Sydney, wherein we would be um, sitting down with a team of you know teachers and um, and the LBD team, and 
mapping out the citizen science projects against the curriculum so that's that's the next step and uh, yeah hopefully we'll you know we will get there and yeah we'll we'll have more outcomes of citizen science into education mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone, for your perspectives. That was really, really interesting. And um, what you've touched on just uh, towards the end, Arj, about um, trying to incorporate the citizen science activities into the curriculum, I find that that is really key in order to engage the teachers and to really get all those learning outcomes that we're hoping to get from engaging young people with citizen science. Um, and I've been talking to a lot of people lately about you know, best practices in doing so. And that is something that continuously sort of is brought up uh, as a really, really important point. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit more, Arj, of how exactly we can do that. And then I'll also wanna hear about from Jen and Aaron, um, how do we do that? How do we connect citizen science to the curriculum? Yeah, that's that's like a million dollar question, Yela. <laughs> um, we we definitely, you know, we we definitely look at the content. So um, again, you know, that emphasis that teachers know what 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 they really want through that particular unit or topic of curriculum. You know, whereas um, we've got this broad um, uh, spectrum of you know many topics involved, um, and. There are citizen science projects that has got the cross-curricular outcomes. So when we are doing, say, for example, we're taking um, tree measurements or doing a land cover project, um, we, we're involving a lot of mathematics into that, you know. So once we, we're able to nail down the cross-curricular um, relationships and the direct outcomes of those projects, that's when probably, you know, it's, it's easy that, um, that we can let the Department of Education know about um, about how we're going about the mapping of these citizen science projects. So um, one one um, example of that was the video that we've just seen is that even though it was a lot of tech based thing, but there was a nature element to it. And uh, having those calculations or having those um, cross curricular components coming together in one component really helps teachers tick those boxes um, you know that they're trying to um, cover during during that um, term of study so I, I think that um, from the environmental perspective um, there are several things there are several projects that that can go across um, not just science but through um, all aspects of STEM, including STEAM and including medicine. So um, that's where I, I, I believe that, you know, we can um, map, map these outcomes, direct outcomes as well as cross-curricular outcomes and help it, you know, um, help, help it, the teachers get the most out of it. I feel like one of the really key parts of trying to integrate citizen science into school curriculum would be making sure that it is super flexible because so many projects are short-term grant funded and you could get you know a school and a teacher really keen on a on one particular project and get it super integrated into their general curriculum but the next year that project no longer has funding and isn't running um, so finding a broader way to have citizen science as, as part of school curricula without it being very project specific, I think would be really important. I think Arj and Erin both bring up some really good points here. I think Arj is really right with the cross curriculum priorities and the general capabilities. It's really easy to see how citizen science fits in with those and, and hits a lot of the numeracy, literacy, ethical understanding, um, critical and creative thinking, all of those things are really important to the, so we've got like a 3D Australian curriculum and, and it's both the content, but also the cross curriculum priorities and the general capabilities and citizen science fits really nicely in there. I think when it comes to content, um, one of the things I'm starting to realize when I'm looking at the essential medicines project is I think sort of looking at the curriculum points and also having a look into some of the learning progression 
progressions literature to try and start to understand how you can look at the curriculum a little creatively, have a look at um, some of the things that students need to know to get to where they need to be at the year level you're looking at and look at where they're going in terms of year 11 and 12 or things you think as a, as a science or STEM professional skills and understandings they need that the thing they're supposed to be learning in that particular year might help them get to. So you can you can draw on those sort of things that are above and below along the learning progression spectrum for those particular contents that you're looking at. That's an idea I'm starting to play with. Um, I think Arj made a really good point that teachers know what they want to get out of the particular unit. And I think it's really important to sort of sit down and listen to them and cultivate really strong conversations and understand what they think they can get out of the unit, what they think the students can get out of the unit. Um, I think Erin makes a really great point about being flexible. One of the things that has come up in our project is we really like the project to go straight into a whole unit embedded thing, but we really have to work with the school and see what they want and what they're willing to do. And I talked about before, it's sometimes teachers really have to rethink the way they do education to embed citizen science. And, and one of the most persuasive things is seeing the way the learners respond to these projects. So sometimes what you need to do is embed the project in a really small way, like a day or a couple of weeks. And then um, you'll get really good, we know we're gonna get really good outcomes from the learners. And then you'll get a whole lot more people in your staff team on board because they'll all know that you're gonna get those outcomes and you've got a much better chance of embedding the citizen science the year after. Um, and I also want to draw attention, it's not just the curriculum we need to think about, and this is something I realised recently as well. Um, there's an Australian Institute of Teacher and Learning Oh, teacher and Leadership, eight SOL standards, A-I-T-S-L. Teachers have to demonstrate that they can do those standards. They have to demonstrate whether it's proficient, um, highly accomplished lead teacher. And there's, go and have a look at the website. There's a whole lot of different things they can do. And there's really nice illustrations of practice. I think if we can think about how teachers can demonstrate that they're a really great teacher, really solidly through being involved in citizen science, that's also a really strong way we can start thinking about this as well. Thank you so much, Jen and everyone. Um, Jen, maybe you can pop a link to that in the chat so everyone can uh, get a look because that I think is a really important uh, point that you've uh, highlighted there. Um, okay, so we've talked about incorporating citizen science in schools and through the curriculum. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, how you've sort of are doing it, uh, why you're doing it. Uh, but I want to go in, into that a little bit more in depth. Why citizen science? What's special about citizen science that you're so excited about it in the context of, um, of students? What kind of um, learning did you see or do we expect to see um, with students that is something that you can't get in any other way? I'm gonna let you decide who's going first. <laughs> I think Ard should. She explained this really nicely. I think the name itself, you know, um, stating citizen science, because science has, as Jen mentioned, you know, in the discussion that um, it's it's so authoritative and it, it really, you know, um, makes it fearful for people when, when it comes to, you know, not really um, into doing science or, you know, making um, people from different backgrounds, basically, what I'm talking about is like they, they really fear and what citizen science is that opening this, you know, um, the philosophy of, you know, anyone can do science and you don't have to be an expert, probably almost um, majority of the citizen science project has got this line uh, under that, that you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to come from a citizen science background. That really invites people um, of all ages to, to come and participate in any project and that brings up opens up um, the willingness. So um, may it be through nature connection or may it be through, um, you know, other aspects of doing citizen science in laboratory um, settings. That's something um, that, that's the first thing that I would say, you know, uh, is, is mm, we, we really want to bring in people there um, or interest, develop interest in. And the outcome, you know, what where we are focused is STEM learning of obviously, because as they say that in 2030 or beyond, you know, five to eight years from now, we don't know which, which, what sort of jobs would exist or the existing jobs, whether, whether they would stay or not. 
So we do need this new expertise where children are not, or, you know, the new coming generation are, is not fearful of um, any of those major STEM disciplines. So um, that's that's why I believe that, you know, it's, it's so uh, doable, friendly. It has got um, the extra tangents, I would say that, you know, mental health, um, socializing, other aspects that people come together for different levels, not just studies and academics, but um, they can they can socialize. And um, while we were doing these projects with youngsters, a couple of councils um, around us approached us doing this for only women or, uh, you know, children or families with children or um, how can we involve men doing these projects? Are, are the projects flexible or adaptable for, you know, for a men's group? And it, it, it totally came down to, you know, what we're doing um, and how we can support. We've given them the ideas and things, but um, I think that those projects are still in pipeline. But as I mentioned, outside of the academic um, circle, um, these these are so flexible. Citizen science projects are so flexible and, and the outcomes could be, you know, from any of those perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, for me, I think citizen science is that key thing that takes learning science away from learning content, which I think is so much a part of science in school and even in undergraduate, you know, at university, it's very content focused until you hit, you know, honours, masters, PhD level, where citizen science allows you to instantly be more about learning the process of science and learning about discovery. And I mean, that's that key thing that makes us all become scientists is that thrill of, of discovering something new. And I think being able to have that at that earlier age in a structured way through citizen science projects is, is a really cool thing. Yeah, I think Arjun and Heron have really discussed that really nicely. I think um, when it comes to education, we, we have this saying of, about how it takes a, a village to educate a child. And I think citizen science is a really beautiful opportunity to achieve um, this thing. Like a lot of schools are really trying to find ways to connect the communities, their local communities, parents, families, um, and everyone in the community to get involved in schools and um, citizen science is a really wonderful way that you can do this. And, and I saw that in the project that I was running in Catherine. And yeah, and I think citizen science sort of really brings science out of just the content and connects it to the real world. Like Erin said, um, learners and young people will be able to see how science is actually relevant to the world around them. And, and that's, that's really powerful. I hope everyone's convinced that citizen science is the next thing. Um, but as we know, um, as everything in life, there are also challenges that come with it. Um, and so for my last question, before we sort of open this up for a broader discussion, uh, I would love to hear, you know, some of the challenges that you've had in the process of engaging young people, of engaging with schools, because, you know, it, it sounds so great, but we know that, you know, things... Um, take time and they're a process and we want to hear about that as well. Erin, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think we're probably still going to come up to that stage. Um, probably the one thing that in terms of discovering what the challenges are because we're yet to really do broad scale involvement of, of teachers and schools. Um, some of the ones that I've come up with or already, I guess, have been the limitations of being able to personalize the project for each individual school or teacher. Um, because it, as um, Jen and Arj have already sort of said, every school and every teacher is different and they're gonna wanna use the project in different ways but we have limited resources in terms of how we can structure it. So um, being able to incorporate enough of that, that that schools and teachers feel comfortable taking it and using it without us, you know, stretching ourselves too thin in terms of, you know, offering a multitude of different options in terms of resources and project designs and all that kind of thing, I think will be a challenge, um, especially for us as we're, we're not restricting it to any particular year level or age group or anything like that. Having project resources that 
teachers at grade three level and grade 10 level can both take and adapt, um, I think is one of the challenges we've been discussing in, in the project team at the moment. Do you want to jump in, Arch? Yeah, I just, um, you know, want to mention that um, the the inbit, like the, you know, um, the more we have um, people involved in it, and the more it is popular, popular, popularized. I would say that, you know, that um, there are certain uh, programs, global programs, wherein um, it's only connected with uh, citizen science is connected to those schools because they've registered and they know about those programs. So it's like if the more we popularize, um, I believe that um, that it's it's going to be easy and um, and it's it's going it's um, not just through um, schools as we've focused um, into education, but through all other um, spectrums. Um, through community engagement and through um, other initiatives through councils that we can um, spread out these projects. That would be helpful here. Yeah. yeah, I definitely agree. I think one of the issues um, that sort of I just touched on is at the moment in Australia, not not that many schools really know that citizen science is the thing they can get involved in. So if we can find ways to spread that and popularize that and spread that message that it is possible and it has wonderful outcomes in ways that make sense to teachers and sort of reflecting on sort of like teachers don't have access to the research we have access to a lot of the time for time and, and you know, even if it's open access, they don't have time, but often it's not open access. Um, how can we sort of get that message out in a way that makes sense to them and is persuasive to them, I think is something we need to think about. Um, we talked also about the challenges of gathering feedback sometimes. Um, we often perceive feedback, I think, in science as sort of maybe a way to measure the impact of our projects. But I was sort of reflecting on how can we actually build relationships that are strong enough that schools can say, hey, that that really didn't work. That was rubbish. You know, how, how can we have build those honest, genuine feedback conversations to actually build on our projects? Um, and I think also Erin touched on this resources thing. I think we said before, both schools and academia are a place that are really time poor, really restricted in many ways. Um, and I think some of these citizen projects, science projects really require this building of long relationships over time. And that can be really tough, particularly for early career researchers when you're sort of supposed to jump in, get a project done in a year or three years and then jump out. That's really tough. And the other thing that I, I know there's starting to be conversations about this in sort of in the space of working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is like building collaborative projects with people in the community and the ethics process, where it's like you really want to build this collaborative project with the people you're involved in, but you're not really supposed to do that until you've done your ethics. But to do your ethics, you really have to know what the project's going to be. So how do you how do we get around that? How do we work within that framework? I don't know, but I think that's a challenge that I see um, in building those genuine collaborative citizen science projects. Okay, I want to thank you, Jen, and thank you, uh, Aaron and Arj. Um, I, just to sum up what I sort of feel that I've been hearing from the three of you and from um, you know other conversations about citizen science uh, and learning, I feel that there's a lot of potential and there's so many great things about it. Um, and I think what we have to remember as you know citizen science researchers and practitioners and educators is that it, it, as everything really, it, it takes some effort and it takes some design and we have to think really carefully what we're doing and who we're speaking with and what the, the needs of the people on the other side are, not just what we wanna implement and do, but what teachers need and how teachers, you know, how they, you know, practice um, teaching in their classroom and what the requirements from them are towards, you know, their teaching goals and working really together with teachers and with schools in order to come up with programs that really work for everyone. Uh, and it, it, it's a process. And I think that's that's the, the main thing that we have to remember, that it's not something that we can just, um, you know, send out and, and will just happen. It's something that we have to continuously work on. 
Um, as we know from our research and from our other practices, I'm sure, 